for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, there are some announcements in your bulletin. What I'd like to point out is that even though it's the third Sunday of the month, we're having board meeting in CCW following the service. And so that's a little strange, but today is a board meeting in CCW. Uh, we ha- next Sunday, we're going to have a, a church outing. Uh, I think it's the first kind like this we've done since COVID started. <laughs> exactly like this. So we're going to have a potluck out at Holiday Lake and uh, out by the ball field in the park out there. And then we're going to play a game of softball later. We have a fun softball that will not injure you, even if it's lined at your face. You can still hit it a long ways, but, but uh, it's squishy. It's for a pitching, pitching machine. And uh, so just so we can, you can play with kids. You don't have to be scared about being out in the field. We would love for you to take some swings and run the bases with us. It'll be a great time. And you can still hit it a really long ways. Thomas, I know that you're interested in that. Absolutely. We can still hit some dingers with this thing. Uh, then I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, something that's up on the bulletin board over here uh, in the North Foyer. Uh, CIBC, their director left after 17 years, and um, uh, they've, we've hired a new guy, Mike Murphy, out of Missouri. And again, not Mark and Patty's son-in-law. Uh, it's just always something you got to clear up here when I say Mike Murphy is hired at CIBC. But their parsonage needs uh, quite a bit of work. The parsonage sits on the camp property, and uh, in order for it to be ready for them to move in, there's there's quite a lot to do there. And I'm actually part of the crew that's trying to round people up to go get that project done. And we need a lot of volunteer help, and I would love it if you guys would help me uh, go out to the CIBC parsonage and get some work done out there so it can be a house ready to move into. Uh, CIBC has has about... uh, supporting churches in the 20s, and we're one of CIBC's supporting churches, and and to that extent, it is our house, and CIBC is our camp, and uh, and we we need to do our part there to help CIBC out with uh, their mission and what we need to do here to get this house ready, and I would love your help. There's a list of of tasks to do out there. Some big ones like the whole second half of the month of September, we need a lot of help painting, right? We need to, and uh, we could use your help doing that, but if you just want to look at a task out there that you might be interested in doing, and a time that might work for you, and talk to me about going out there, I might, I probably would even go out with you, and uh, we can work on the house, and so if you guys just want to look at that, that's in the North Foyer, and uh, just give that uh, some consideration, maybe going out and working on the CIBC Parsonage with me. Now we're going to go to time of prayer. Good to see the sunshine. We certainly need more rain, but God will give us rain if we want, if we need it bad enough, I guess. Uh, for prayer time this morning, uh, one announcement that was not, or one uh, prayer that was not in the bulletin was our church family grew by one this past week. Katie and Cade Cole, Katie and Cade Lang, excuse me, had a little baby girl, Riley Anna Lee, I believe I pronounced it right, Lang, uh, Craig and Mary's granddaughter, Maynard's great-granddaughter. So uh, please be in prayer for them this, as she grows up in our church family here. Also in your bulletin, the family of Joan Alexander. If you don't know, that is Mike Van Renerham's mother-in-law who passed away. Uh, Mike said the funeral was uh, last Friday, so continue to lift the Alexander family up this week. And the only other announcement I have is uh, Margaret Dyer, uh, Diane's mother, was in uh, Grinnell for quite some time, and she has moved down to Brookhaven now, so it would be a closer to our church. So Diane said maybe, maybe she will get her mother out here so we can all visit her each and every Sunday. So please be with them. Also be with our, uh, all of our nursing home residents. It's great to see Barb here. Her smile brings joy every time she steps in here. So thank you for making breaking out, I should say, instead of coming out. <laughs> but so please play for her as well as Jack, uh, Carol, and Judy also. So instead of me standing here going through everything, uh, we'll just have some quiet time to ourselves. I'll kind of lead us through it, and then I will close with prayer. So please bow with me, if you would, please, in prayer. As we come to you today, Lord, we have much, much to be thankful for. We have much to pray for. 
We pray for the Alexander family. We pray for the new birth of Riley. Please be with her and her family as, as they grow in Christ and uh, as she grows up. Also pray for our church family that's confined to a nursing home. Margaret, Jack, Barb, Carol, and Judy. also lift up four others that we have in the past. We pray for continued healing for them, Craig, Mike, Andrew, and Dave. We lift them up to you this time in prayer for continued healing, and we thank you for the healing that you have done. We continue praying for those that are fighting this terrible thing called cancer in the different stages of treatment. We lift up Rose, Gail, and Renee. again up our prayers for those that are dealing with the COVID-19. It's been over a year, Lord, and you've done many, much healing for many, but we still need our prayers for Josh, Beth, and Angie. This time we lift up those in our hearts and our minds that were not spoken this morning, but we certainly lift them up to you. You know them better than we do, and we know that you know their needs and wants. We lift them up to you at this time, Lord, in private prayer. As we open our service this morning, Lord, please open our hearts and our minds this morning to receive the words that will be spoken and the songs that will be sang as we lift you up as our King, our Savior, and our Lord. We ask all of these things in your Son, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us this morning?
communion meditation this morning. I don't know if many of you know how long I've been up here giving communion meditation, but it's been four and a half years. And uh, the one thing that I've realized uh, quite some time ago that is that I pay more attention to what is being said. And uh, I try to understand in greater detail the meaning of what is being said. Um, maybe part of it is the age factor also. Also, the words in the song, just like we just got through singing, and even songs on the radio, uh, I, get, I, I have a greater meaning for them now, just because I guess I listen better, maybe. I also do a little more reading than I normally do. And I was reading in a rural water magazine uh, a couple weeks ago. And in an article, there was kind of just italicized words. It really stuck out. And I looked at it, and I read it. And it really got me to thinking. And uh, it was set apart from the other paragraphs. And, and being a rural water magazine, it had to do with the necessity of life, and that being water. So I'd like to read them three little short lines. Knowledge is measuring that a desert path is 12 miles long. Wisdom is packing enough water for this hike. And insight is building a lemonade stand at mile number six. <laughs> it was kind of comical, but I really, truly got thinking a lot about that. And it has a lot to do with life in three words, knowledge, wisdom, and insight. So I thought it has a lot to do with our spiritual life as well. We all get up here and talk about knowledge, wisdom, and insight that we have. So I kind of put it with uh, spiritual life in mind to describe them three words. Knowledge is knowing that we have to have, e is, knowledge is knowing if we want to have eternal life in heaven, the path begins with believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And he gave up his life so that we may spend eternity with him. That is knowledge that we all have. Wisdom. Wisdom is knowing that eternal life can be measured as a distance of 3,000 miles. And our life on earth is one inch of that eternal life. We also know that this one inch will decide where we will spend our eternity. Wisdom also tells us that our path will have many heartaches and many, many setbacks. Many hills that will seem unclimbable and many questions and even fewer answers. Now, insight's a word that I hardly ever use, to be right honest. And insight is knowing that we are to be a faithful servant of the Lord throughout our one inch of life for us here on earth. Jesus' life on earth was spent being a faithful servant to his Father, and that's what we need to be as well. I'd like to read uh, very quickly 2 Timothy verses 3 through 7. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victory's, victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Reflect on what I am saying, the Lord, or this is uh, Paul talking to Timothy. And Paul says at the end, reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all things. That is why at this time we take communion. It is through these emblems that our table, that's sitting on our table, that we can come we can claim victory over death. Will you please pray with me? 
Lord, thank you for the knowledge, the wisdom and insight that is given to each one of us through your words and teachings. We stand before you today knowing you are the way, the truth, and the life along our path to eternity in heaven with you. Please bless the cup and the loaf, the emblems of your broken and very beaten body that you gave freely, all out of love for each one of us. We ask all these things in your son's Jesus' name. given us so much. You've given us this building, this congregation, this family of friends. You've given us words from today that we may take into the week, a message from Joel. But most of all, you've given us your word. If we were to follow those, we will receive salvation and eternal life in your kingdom. We take this offering and use it for your kingdom. In our lifetimes, there have been some pretty poorly staged exits. I'm wondering if you can think of some. I, I tried this week. 
I, th I thought of Michael Jordan, who was my favorite athlete to watch of all time. But at the end there, he was coming off the bench for the Washington Wizards. That was hard. That was hard to watch MJ do that. It was hard to watch those last two seasons of The Office without Steve Carell. It's a hard way to go out. It was hard to watch Jay Leno unretire and kick Conan O'Brien off of his show so that he could have this weird late night thing where he didn't have a desk anymore. That was strange. It was hard to watch Mike Tyson chomping off Evander Holyfield's ear instead of boxing anymore. It's been hard to watch any Adam Sandler movie for the last 10 years. <laughs> These are not the way to go out. These are not graceful exits. These are this is not the way to exit the stage. The best you can do is to have a successful and, and dramatic exit where you go out on top or at your best. I think of people who did it well, John Elway, Peyton Manning, and, and Tom Osborne, all went out champions the year that they retired. Kobe Bryant, he did not go out a champion, but in his last game ever in the NBA, he put up 60 points at the Staples Center, and it was electric. Or a TV show that did it well is MASH. You, may, you probably did watch the MASH finale. It is still in the top 10 ranked most watched television programs of all time. It went out on top. Today we're going to read the account of one of the greatest exits in the Bible. From 2 Kings chapter 2, if you want to open there with me. Because today our, the story of Elijah is coming to a close. And he's going to exit in a fantastic fashion. Elijah... Uh, was a nobody from nowhere, a Tishbite from Tishbe, and he was called by God to confront King Ahab, who was immensely successful and popular and wealthy. He was sent to confront him for his sin, his idolatry, because he was worshiping Baal, and he and his wife Jezebel were leading the Israelites to worship this foreign god. Elijah was sent to confront him, and, and then uh, after a while, Elisha had a failure where he ran away from Jezebel and, and failed in his mission as a prophet, and, and from there, he was sent to find Elisha, his friend, so Elijah and Elisha, those are two different people. Elisha is Elijah's understudy, and now Elijah's ministry is on his third king, okay? He's been at this for a while. Ahaziah has died, and... Um, and Elijah's been doing this for, for more than 25 years. He's been a prophet for God. But it's time for Elijah to exit stage left, and that's what we're going to read about today in 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's start there in verse 1 this morning. We read, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. Uh, how is that for spoiling the story right away? I'm not getting a lot of help this morning from the author of Kings. Uh, talk about ruining the suspense. It turns out that Elijah's exit, the way that he would depart, was an extremely poorly kept secret. Not only is it leaking out here in the first verse of 2 Kings chapter 2, but it seems like everybody knew. Uh, Elijah tells Elisha to let him go alone. And let's pick up with Elisha's response here in verse 2 as we read on. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the, to the Jordan, Jordan River. He replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. You kind of see Elijah trying to shake off Elisha here. 
so that he can depart without him. Uh, but Elisha's not going to let go, and he seems frustrated that everybody keeps telling him that Elijah is about to depart. He says, yes, I know. Be quiet. It's like I know the Huskers are going to lose seven games this year. Just stop talking to me about it. Mm, how dare you? How dare you? You just don't want to hear the bad news over and over, right? That's where Elisha's at. Uh, we're going to keep reading here. This is where you can pick up in your bulletin, starting in verse 7. This is after they've crossed the Jordan River. It says, 50 men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, he rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. This would be Elijah's last miracle. Now, first I want to talk about who, who are these company of the prophets? Like, what is that? Uh, it seems, and we see it plays in the Old Testament, that there was a kind of a guild of prophets. And so these would have been people who are training or about the practice of prophesying. And uh, they may have been sort of prophets in the mold of, that you would find commonly in the ancient Near East that would practice divination in various ways. And they are, for some reason, following Elijah and Elisha around in this story. Uh, we've run into them before. Saul prophesies with them in 1 Samuel 19. Uh, even though he doesn't want to, he's kind of coaxed by the Lord into going there. And in the story with Saul, Saul joins them, he prophesies, and it says he removes his cloak and lays out day and night. And one of my favorite uh, Bible teachers, his name is Bob Utley, says that that is a strange way to get a strange sunburn. Um, but so there's this company of prophets, and they're probably trainees, uh, probably someone like Elisha, who was training to follow in the footsteps of Elijah. And let me just show you this route that we've talked about here on the map. Uh, you couldn't have gone through all those names of towns and didn't think that this was coming. Uh, but uh, Gilgal is where they start. Now the problem, uh, one problem that we have is there are at least three different Gilgals in the Old Testament. So the Gilgal that appears on this map by Jericho is probably not the one we're talking about. We're probably talking about one by, by Jebba. Uh, it's also mentioned in 1 Samuel 13. So the first trip they take is from Gilgal to Bethel, and then they're going from Bethel over to Jericho, and from Jericho they go across the Jordan River. I just want to point this out because I think it's fun that, that where they end up, where this story takes place, is in the vicinity of Mount Nebo and Pisgah on the other side of the Jordan River. This is where Moses, uh, hit, where Moses' journey ended as well. This is where Moses was taken up, uh, where, he, where he ascended Mount Pisgah, and he was shown the promised land uh, to the west so that he could see it before he died. And I think that there is some imagery at work here uh, about the failure of the Israelites to inhabit the promised land faithfully. And that Elijah is, is kind of marking this, this failure by, by leaving the promised land, by crossing the Jordan River on dry ground, just like the Israelites did, but this time in reverse to leave, uh, to, count, to go to Mount Nebo and Mount Pisgah. And then Moses and Elijah just share this link of this place is where, uh, where they exited this world. And, and surprisingly, Moses and Elijah will show up together in our passage next week. So it's fun that they share this place. Let's continue reading in verse 9 of 2 Kings chapter 2. We read there, oh, When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha says, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. That's quite a thing for Elisha to ask, isn't it? Elijah is this prophet of God that's been ministering for over 25 years, and Elijah has called down fire from heaven that was hot enough to burn up stones and, and just uh, make an altar disappear. Uh, Elijah has done great and mighty things for the Lord, and Elisha is asking for a double portion of his spirit. It's always struck me as arrogant, but it's only if we misunderstand what is meant here. Uh, Elisha wasn't asking to be twice the prophet 
that Elijah was. That's not, that's not what he means. Uh, instead, when Elisha asks for uh, a double portion of his spirit, he's asking for the inheritance of a firstborn son. In the ancient Near East, in, in Israel, when they would divide up the, uh, the estate of the parents, uh, they would say they had three children, they would, it would be divided up into four, and the oldest son would receive a double portion. And then the oldest son would essentially be the, the, the one who is to carry the torch or to, to uh, be the representative of the family with this gift and responsibility of having a double portion of the inheritance. And so this is what we see Elisha asking for here. It is not, Elisha is not asking, well, make me twice as good a prophet as you are. That would be hubris. Uh, what Elisha is asking is, can I be your heir? Can I be your successor? Can I come after you and, and take up your job? And this is what Elisha is asking for. Then notice the condition that Elijah gives him. Elijah says, well, that, that's a hard thing to ask for. Elijah has a pretty difficult job. It's been pretty hard on him, as, as you know, as we've gone through this story. Elijah says that he will have it. He will have a double portion of his spirit. He will get to follow up on Elijah's ministry if he sees Elijah when he's taken from you. Elijah is telling his understudy that if you are ready to see the spiritual reality above and beyond what everyone else sees, then you are ready to be my heir, my successor. It's a challenge to see the spiritual realm, to, uh, to be able to have that a knowledge and awareness, something we see Elisha uh, using later in his ministry, uh, of what is really happening behind the reality that everyone else sees so that he can minister to God's people. Uh, then the action starts in verse 11. Things really pick up. In verse 11, we read, As they were walking along together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he, Elisha, took a hold of his garment and tore it in two. Now, it's a popular misunderstanding. We think of El Elijah being taken up to heaven in a chariot. We even have a song about a sweet chariot swinging low, right? But uh, this isn't how it works. The chariot just divides. They separate Elisha and Elijah. And Elijah is taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. About the chariot, God is often seen and depicted in a chariot or in a throne with wheels, in the Old Testament. So this would not be strange to imagine God's presence being manifested or revealed in a chariot. So God separates Elijah and then whisks him up to heaven, and the implication is that Elijah never experiences death. This is a pretty good way to go out. Okay, this is better than the MASH finale. The only other person we read of this happening to in the Bible is Enoch in Genesis chapter 4. And there we're told that, that Enoch was spared from death because he walked faithfully with God. Now, when Elijah is on his way out, Elisha sees him. Elisha sees all this, and, and he yells out to Elijah, describing what he sees, so that Elijah will know that Elisha has passed the test. Elijah said, well, you'll, you'll, you, you'll get to inherit a double portion of my inheritance. You'll get to be... Uh, You'll get to follow up on my ministry if you see me being taken away. And as Elijah's taking away, taken away, Elisha says, I see it. I see the chariot and horsemen of Israel. So now uh, that's how we know that Elisha will indeed, uh, he has passed the test and he will carry on Elijah's ministry to the people of Israel. Let's finish reading the passage now, picking up in verse 13. There we read, Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. 
And they went out to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. And so indeed, we see here that Elisha has been given Elijah's power, that he is now God's uh, instrument to minister to the Israelites. And the story goes on with, uh, with Elisha in 2 Kings, so we will not follow it, uh, but you are welcome to. Um, so I want you to look at what happened here with Elisha and Elijah. I want to point out uh, two important things that we learned from this moment when Elijah's taken away. First, I want you to look at Elijah's exit, the blessing he gets in being taken away from the world without having to suffer death, being picked up and taken into heaven by God himself in the context of Elijah's failure from 1 Kings chapter 19. Just five chapters in the Bible before this story, roughly six years before this event, Elijah had failed spectacularly. Elijah had not just done a bad job, but he imperiled and essentially doomed the faithfulness of the people of Israel who seemed ready to worship the one true God there after what happened on Mount Carmel, seemed ready to, to switch sides and be faithful. He let them all down when he ran away and he gave up on his ministry and he left and, and cried out for God to take his life in the desert. But here is Elijah, six years later, being taken into heaven in this incredible sign of God's favor and approval. And here again, we learn this lesson that we've been repeating for three weeks, that God can restore you and that God wants to restore you. And that once here, this week, what we learned is that once you're restored by God, like Elijah has been restored from his sin, that your guilt is gone, that your shame is gone. Elijah's sin and his failure were not part of this day in 2 Kings chapter 2. That's not part of the story, right? Elijah gets, uh, gets exalted, gets honored by God in a way that only one other person in history had been before and, and no other person that we know of since him has. Even though he failed so spectacularly, so miserably, Elijah's sin and his failure were not part of this day here in 2 Kings 2. So your sin and your failure the ones in your past don't need to be a part of this day in 2021. God wants to restore you, and, and not just to bring you back from where you were, to, to help you back to a life that is full and joyful, but he wants to remove the shame from what you went through. He wants, and he wants to, and he can do it. He has the power to take away your shame so that even before him, in his presence, your failure is forgotten. Your sin is behind you, not a part of your story now. Elijah's sin and Elijah's failure, were, they were bad. But it didn't matter in 2 Kings 2. Six years later, it did not matter. Six years later, Elijah is being honored by God and being whisked away into heaven by God himself without tasting death. This truth about God's desire to restore and forgive us is one repeated all over the Bible. Let me just show you one more of those places this morning from Joel chapter 2. We read there, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten the great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and I will, and you will, rather, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. That was a message to, to people who had sinned terribly and to people who, who God had punished with a swarm of locusts and said, I, I sent those, I punished you. And God is saying, I will restore you. I will repay you for the years 
that the locusts have eaten. And, and then your shame will be taken away. This is what God is. This is who God is. This is what he does. This is what he did for Elijah when he took away his shame, when he left his sin behind, and when he honored Elijah in this way that we read about in 2 Kings 2. And that's what he wants to do for you. God doesn't want you to carry around the burden of guilt and shame from your failures or your sin. He doesn't even want to just bring you back to to a functional life or, or a way to get by. He wants to wash it all away, all the shame, all the guilt, and he will leave it behind. He is even willing to do this for Elijah, who put a number of people's souls in peril in, in 1 Kings 19. And he will do it for you. If you have somebody in your life that, that you just think... Uh, is never going to turn around, that, it is, that you're ready to give up on, he will do it for them. It's worth, it's worth it to hang in there and keep praying for them and keep working on them because God can restore them. God can restore you and he can restore them. He can forgive their sin. He can take away their shame. So keep at it. Here in this passage in Joel, we also see that the These people are not just restored. Their shame is taken away. Their shame is taken away. And that's what we see here for Elijah in 2 Kings 2. Finally, this morning, I want to point out that Elijah's last and possibly his most important role was to prepare Elisha for God's service. We don't get to read a lot about the interaction, or we don't get to read really anything at all about the interactions between Elijah and Elisha. They were probably together for six years. But Elijah has prepared Elisha for God's service, and when Elijah departs this world, Elisha is ready to take up his ministry and be a witness for God, be a prophet for God to the people of Israel. That kind of mentorship and relationship is is something we call discipleship. And it is something that we are all called to do. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave this instruction to his disciples in in Matthew 28. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's That's a burden, a task, a responsibility that all of us share together. And and here we see Elijah doing this for, for Elijah. So where we see Elijah doing this for Elisha before these words were even spoken. Discipleship may seem like a difficult or challenging thing to try to take up, but you are discipling anytime you are encouraging someone in their faith. You are especially discipling anytime you single out somebody in your life somebody that you are committed to investing in so that their faith will grow to promote their faithfulness and love of God. For Elijah, this was Elisha. This was a companion who could come along beside him and and learn from him and then take up his ministry when Elijah could no longer do it because he was gone. Who is your Elisha? Do you have somebody in your life that you can identify that you're bringing along, that you're, whose faith you are encouraging? Can you find someone in your life to make that investment in? Elijah had a blessed ministry more than 25 years. But Elisha ministered to Israel for 60. Preparing Elisha was the most important thing that Elijah did. And oftentimes, the greatest impact that you can make for God's kingdom is to disciple others like Elisha did for Elijah. The most important thing you can do is to, is to find someone to invest in their faith, to help them grow in the love of the Lord. This can be uh, 
coworkers or friends. It doesn't have to be somebody younger than you. It can be somebody older than you. It can be a parent. Each of us parents here in this room has this opportunity to do this for our children. So I want to encourage you to find someone to disciple, meaning someone whose faith you can encourage. Find people in your life, usually the ones who are already there, right? Usually the relationships that already exist and, and identify one or some of them that you can invest in someone's faith, start encouraging and building up their love of the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the witness of Elijah. Thank you for showing us your pleasure with him. Thank you for showing us the honor that you showed him at his death, even though he failed you, like we often do. Dear God, even though you forgive us, and even though our sins are washed away, we still carry them around. I still carry them around. God, just set us free from that. Help us to experience the forgiveness that you offer. Help us to live the freedom that you give. Dearly Father, I pray for us as a church that we can be discipling believers. Dear God, show us the people in our lives who we can encourage in their faith. Give us a heart for it and the energy and commitment that it takes to bring up a next generation, a new generation of believers. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close today?